It's been a very strange year. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic became a global phenomenon. It has changed the very fabric of how we operate as a society. And in the United Kingdom, it's forced all of us to face restrictions that most of us never thought we would ever experience. Everybody has been affected in some way or another. People have had to avoid seeing loved ones. Weddings have been postponed and holidays canceled. Births have been missed by loving partners. The economy has crumbled and businesses have had to dramatically reduce staff or have been forced to close down altogether, leaving thousands upon thousands without an income. In my experience, no single group of people have been hit harder financially than the hospitality industry and a category of workers that I myself am included in, the self-employed. It became clear to me that with our current second lockdown, that the scales are not equally balanced and that we are no longer respected, valued or supported by our current government. And so, with my video camera and a lot of spare time on my hands, I set out to make a documentary about the hardships that pubs and self-employed people have had to face. I wanted to do what, in my opinion, the government and the mainstream media have so far been failing to do, to get their voices heard. You will shortly be able to type in your postcode to gov.uk and see exactly what restrictions apply where you live. Over the weekend, we've been working with local leaders in areas where the data are most worrying. And from Wednesday, local authorities in the Liverpool city region will move to the very high alert level. My name is Andrew Fisher, and I've been a self-employed musician and video producer for nearly a decade. I live and work in New Brighton, a coastal town situated on the Wirral Peninsula in Merseyside, England. As part of the Liverpool City region, my town was one of the first areas in the country to enter the new Tier 3 local lockdowns. At the minimum, they will sadly include a ban on all social mixing between households in private places, including gardens, and pubs and bars must close unless they can operate solely as a restaurant serving alcohol only as part of a main meal. This seaside resort was largely developed during the early 1800s by a merchant named James Atherton. It was further developed over the decades to become a working class holiday resort. Unfortunately, New Brighton fell into a steady decline after the Second World War. The Tower Ballroom burnt down in 1969, and the piers were dismantled in the 70s. The Lido and swimming pool finally succumbed to a storm in 1990. No longer a popular holiday resort, the town fell into a state of disrepair. However, in the past few years, it's had a vital regeneration, with the construction of a new cinema, a new shopping complex, and new restaurants and pubs. One area of the town has seen a lot of development, spearheaded by a local man who has injected new life into Victoria Road and its surrounding buildings. Uh, my name is Daniel Davis and I'm the CEO of Rockpoint Leisure, which is a leisure company based in New Brighton. Daniel Davis has developed several new businesses under his Rockpoint Leisure company, and he's commissioned loads of mural artworks on the sides of buildings in the area a very popular ongoing project that has attracted tourists and artists from all over the UK. At the beginning of this second lockdown, Daniel made national headlines when his flagship pub, the James Atherton, had a brand new name change, reflecting his feelings on the current political situation. He's massively cheered up the north of England who are happy that London are unhappy. I think it's the feedback I've got from my friends in the north. Yeah, in the Wirral, uh, one landlord has renamed his pub as a protest against lockdown. Anyone know what he's called it? 
He's changed its name to the Three Bellows. Yes. <laughs> to the Three Bellows. <laughs> I just thought these bell ends and then I just thought we needed a name change. So I got on the phone, I got our designers, we're fairly quick acting, had all the science produced and within 24 hours it was up. This, is, this pub is the James Avison pub, um, it was the railway, we converted it to the James Avison when we started uh, investing in New Brighton. And it, the, the sad thing was that we actually traded it for 51 weeks uh, after spending about £750,000 uh, uh, converting it. Uh, and we had to shut down exactly a week before um, it would have been our anniversary. That was the first lockdown. And so if it had been the hospitality industry, I take phone calls every single day from companies that are made to mind that have been around a long time and they're just, they're just closing the doors forever. What would you say to the government blaming? Hospitality venues. I think it's a convenient uh, place to lay the blame, but it, it's not backed up at all by any facts. So, so the fact that people might have gone to the pub or the restaurant, which will have been properly, um, you know, controlled, uh, so it gets put down to that. They forget that they've been to multiple other places, got on public transport. You know, why isn't the door getting blamed in all of these other places? This is, a, this is a depression that we're going into, not a recession. Further down Victoria Road, I spoke to John Smith, the owner of a small pub named the Bowlegged Beagle that has managed to stay afloat with their takeout service of real ales. I think in the initial phase, uh, I think we were all quite surprised um, when we were closed. Uh, it came as quite a shock to me. I was a bit disappointed. We didn't find out, people maybe don't see, we didn't find out directly from any government body. We were told um, by the media, the newspapers. In fact, I got a phone call from a friend of mine while I was working saying that, do you know you have to close tonight? And that was uh, 8 o'clock on the, the Friday night. We were closing. It was a bit of a body blow, to be honest with you. So that was disappointing. The furlough schemes are being removed um, and been repli to replace with this job support scheme, which is really 67% of our employees' wages. And certainly in terms of turnover, I mean, we're doing well to stay afloat as, as we're going, creeping along, eking along, obviously, with the new uh, restrictions that have been brought in um, with the COVID virus since March. So we've had to adapt the business quite a lot, um, reduce our capacity. We're only small venues, so that's a big hit for us, really. Um, that's generally really where we've been, we've sort of been hit. We've been able to reduce the numbers we allowed into our pubs at any one time, so it's been difficult. Just across the road is a hotel and bar that offers live entertainment. I've played regular gigs there myself. Like some kind of madness was taking control. My name's Sarah and I'm the general manager at the New Brighton Hotel Bar and Lounge. We've only been here for two years. In September it was two years we moved in. So we kind of learnt what the business was about when we took it over for the first 12 months and then the regeneration had kicked off. But certainly since all of the art, um, obviously Rock Point have opened so many different businesses along the street, quite varied as well, which is amazing. We noticed that it had just been getting better and better and better, and then we got shut. <laughs> <laughs> My boss, Gary, has been really good with the staff, so um, anyone who is entitled to furlough is only entitled to 60%, I think, now. He's chopping us up to 80%, which is coming out of his own pocket. It's making a loss for him personally. Um, the business just, obviously, we're short. We're not making any money. We're just accruing more debt. We've still got bills to pay with nothing coming in to pay them, so everything that he pays us above that 60% is coming out of his pocket. I tested positive um, the beginning of September. As soon as my taste and smell went, I started isolating straight away and it took me a couple of days before I could get a test. So it was probably about three days after I started trying. I mean, to be honest, I I'm young and I'm generally quite healthy anyway, so 
hopefully that was on my side. I don't know what the, the lasting effects might be, but I really found the isolation part of it the most difficult. And I think it started to make me feel ill in myself um, as a result of being stuck in, not of coronavirus. I think that the isolation during lockdown has caused a lot of people to feel this way. However, I'd go even further. I'd say the general feeling of panic has been fueled by conspiracy theories and by a media machine intent on causing shock and controversy. Worst of all, the government's confusing and conflicting information, flip-flopping from one muddled response to the next without any clear handle on things. I think the untold mental health um, strain is, is, is going to pan out for decades. And a kid born tomorrow will be paying this off for the rest of their life. People also need, on the other side, that's work-life balance. You need to be able to go and enjoy yourself. You need things to take your mind off it. It's always been that way. It just makes people feel better. And it, it's scandalous the way um, ourselves and the hospitality industry and the entertainment industry are really paying quite a heavy price for it at the moment. It's like the Hunger Games, isn't it? <laughs> it's like District 13, it's like us in Tier 3. It's, that, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's like, OK, I've, I sign my messages now of people saying Aaron in Tier 3. <laughs> Aaron Hayes is an all-round entertainer. He hosts my local pub quiz at the Pilot Boat, as well as quizzes at the Lake in Hoy Lake and the Camp and Furnace in Liverpool. And he works as a singer, a magician, a radio presenter, a football coach and as an MC for events. I think, I think that's it, <laughs> yeah. Each summer at the bandstand in Vale Park, New Brighton, Aaron hosts a children's talent and variety show named Joytime. It's a family entertainment show, let's call it, call it, call it that. Joytime was cancelled this year on account of the pandemic, disappointing many eager contestants and representing weeks of lost work and income for Aaron himself. We put a proposal towards the, the council, said, look, we think we can do this, social distanced. But on our, well, our busiest day we've had there, we had, we had over 700. We are thinking if we can cut it down to maybe 150, 200 people in, in blocks, in grids, um, we might be able to get away with it. But the issue wasn't people inside, the issue was getting them in, because obviously they're gonna queue and congregate all around and stuff, unless we gave them time slots. Yeah, the council just said, no, we can't, we, we can't, we can't do it. Yes, I'm a singer, so I'll do pub work and I'll do quizzes in pubs or venues and stuff, but uh, as a magician, it's it's hotels and it's things like that. When, because all of a sudden they dropped the numbers down of a wedding. So they were saying, oh, you can have 30 people at a wedding. And then, well, that's great, but you're not gonna choose your magician over a, a family member or you know so all entertainment stopped for weddings as well so there was just um there was just just nothing like nothing at all was happening the entertainment industry in the uk is on its knees at the moment halfway through october an old government advertising campaign spread like wildfire online this campaign was originally geared at trying to get people into jobs in cyber but it resurfaced with a new context after the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, seemed to suggest in an interview with ITV News that people in the creative industries should start rethinking their careers. Isn't that horrible? It's really insulting. Isn't that horrible? Yeah. Really, it's really insulting. Yeah. Just never thought we'd end up living in footloose. You know, essentially, you know what I mean? We live in this town, we live in this area now where there's no singing allowed, no dancing, no, you know, there's nothing at all because someone said, no, it's bad, it's bad. Um, do, you should all behave and do something else. And it isn't easy. I've done this job since I was 18 now. That's, it's my, it's my career. But that's, that's what I do. It's not, it isn't a hobby. It's not something I play a lot around with. And I know there's some people who'll do it on the side and they'll have their Monday to Friday job, their nine to five, their real job. Um, but that's not, that isn't what it is for, for us, for us guys. It's, it's our job, it's our career. It's the only thing we do. Um, and I've t I take, I took a bit of offense over the, the retraining thing because I kind of think, well, why should I? Why, why should I know, and I know people go, well, you have to now, don't you? I think, well, but I've put 20 years of training into this. Cause I'm a musician. Right. So like, um, 
Before. Well, you should go and retrain as uh, I think you should go and be a, you know, uh, yeah, a cyber. <laughs> I mean, fuck off. Who the fuck are they to tell us? And people who have decided to go into the arts, music, whatever they want, their hopes and dreams. And you get them just saying, oh, and, you know, you're going to be a wind farm engineer or you're going to, you know, go fuck yourself. The last yeah. time I looked, we lived in a, a democracy. And, and that is getting very, very quickly eroded. Yeah. You know, I don't want to live in a country where I can't fucking move out of my house, where I can't have a pint, where I can't sing, where I can't dance, yeah. where I can't... I mean, you know, for fuck's sake, it's 2020. I don't know why the self-employed are hated so much. That because it's not just... And it isn't just the arts. It isn't just the arts. And I know that I've, I'm in the arts as such. It isn't just the arts that I've been forgotten about. It's... Like my aunt is a um, a mobile hairdresser, so that goes uh, immediately. That's that's a tough one anyway. Um, there's painters and decorators. There's uh, you know I don't know bricklayers, um, gardeners. All these things all of a sudden are just gone. And it's not yes the arts as well, but there just doesn't seem to be. I don't know. There just doesn't seem to be enough help or enough support for them. It's uh, with the slogan was like rethink, re re reboot, and and it's like we, that's what needs to happen to the government, really. Before the lockdowns, Ant Wilson was one of the busiest musicians that I know, playing several times a week as a solo artist and with his covers band, The Minutemen. Like many. He's frustrated at the confusion caused by the political establishment. It's just believing what's going on and what, what, you know, what, what, what the what are the facts? What are the real facts? What are the real numbers? Are these colour charts real? Are, are we really meant to be in tier three? Is this just something against us? You know, if it is as serious as the saying, which I personally don't believe anything that, that the government is saying at the minute, it's like this one rule for one, one for another. Then maybe you know the pub should be shut, but as long as they're all getting the support, financially that, that they deserve. There's nothing we can do about it. Like they're up here and we're down here kind of thing. And especially in the North, I just feel like we've been pushed aside. And it's like, you know, find scraps and survive basically. And it's, it's wrong, you know, especially when they're giving out, you know, private medical contracts to all these you know, millionaires and stuff. And MPs wages have had a, a wage rise again. Compared to like, you know, years ago when we had problems like Margaret Thatcher and stuff in the 80s and everything, everything was just newspapers. Whereas nowadays everything's social media and things break days before like the tier three thing. And I mean, I was watching an interview with the mayor of Manchester the other day and he was saying, I have to find out about things through like online and social media and stuff like pubs are and stuff and he's the mayor of Manchester and it's just kind of like, well, you know, if you're not communicating with him and he's the mayor of one of your biggest cities, it's kind of like, you know, and with the pub, with the pub game as well, I do feel sorry for pubs because they, they're in the same boat as everyone else, they don't know what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, why should we be trained, you know, I've been a self-employed musician for years now and I've been you know, I started off doing it like nine years ago and I had to learn year by year more and more things. We went and did the peaceful protest outside Matthew Street for musicians with, with the, that Dave Dutton put together. Um, we will be heard. We went down, you know, there was no trouble, everyone social distance and we stood outside Matthew Street because, you know, we deserved to be heard. I moved to Liverpool to, to work on Matthew Street full time. And the reason I moved is because I see Matthew Street as being one of the most important places for music in this country, if not the most important places for live music in this country. Situated in the heart of Liverpool city centre, the cobbled stones of Matthew Street have been walked upon for decades by countless musicians. Famously known for the Cavern Club, the early home of the Beatles, Matthew Street has seen legendary artists take the stage at its many historic music venues. Now eerily quiet, with only a handful of establishments that remain open because they happen to serve food, it's something of a ghost town. I was here to talk to some of its most prolific current musicians. Hey, my name's Barry. My name's Carl. David Dutton. What's your name then? My name's Ollie. 
I'm a, <laughs> yeah, I'm Ollie, I'm a musician, uh, work on Matthew Street, yeah. I'm a musician and I'm a self-employed musician. A uh, musician on Matthew Street, a uh, one-man band, have a loop pedal, and uh, yeah. <laughs> you started, <laughs> you, was, you were smirking and you were about to start me yeah. Recently, a silent demonstration took place on Matthew Street, and this video went viral online. We are self-employed musicians who have been given less help than many others. Should restrictions on our ability to work continue or worsen, it is predicted that we will only receive 20% of our profits from the government. We cannot survive on this. We are not asking for charitable donations. All we ask for is an equitable distribution of resources in order to survive this crisis. Please share this video. We are viable. We will be heard. Protesting for more equality in public welfare and support for self-employed musicians in the UK during the lockdown. The We Will Be Heard campaign is at the very heart of what I'm trying to achieve by making this film. I spoke to four members of the group and here's what they had to say. There's 48 uh, musicians all in all at work in these venues. Um, but then obviously you've got the Cavern Club and the pub and then you've got more venues down the street as well. I mean there must be there must be three, four hundred working musicians on the street alone, surely, between your drummers and your bass players and your singers and your, 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 then there's your DJs and everything. And that's where this year's kind of hit hard, because I have heard nothing but horror stories. And, you know, it's brought me, like, down to here, because normally I'm calling them, like, listen, can you come and do a gig, come and do this, come on, this is all going on, it's going to be great. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, we've got all this going on. And now, you know, this year's just been, I've just been the bad news guy. And obviously, that's happened across the whole sector, um, but on a personal note, that's destroyed me, seeing all these, like, just so talented, all these uh, musicians just, like, just absolutely heartbroken, really, by the whole thing. It was absolutely terrifying because music is the only thing that I'm, I'm good at, and to, for, for that to all stop, especially at the start when musicians weren't offered any sort of financial help, it was it was terrifying. I, I spent weeks waiting, watching the watching the briefings, waiting, looking up online. When are we going to hear the word self-employed? Because they they had we're going to shut everything. We're in lockdown. The nation's in lockdown. Great, fine, whatever. The disease is what it is. If the science says we've got to do this. We're going to do it. Furlough scheme announced. Eight percent furlough, topped up by businesses if they want to. Great. What about me? What about the guys I work with? You know, where was self-employed? And it took, I think it was two or three weeks before anyone even mentioned on the TV self-employed. We were forgotten about for a long time. And it just, it felt like we didn't exist really. It was like they just didn't care about us at all. I had a kind of a positive spin on it because we just had a new baby. So I thought, well, you know, it won't be too long. And I get to see the baby growing up and all those first words first steps and all that I thought was going to be great but we'll get back to it at some point so it's okay it's just a glitch really. It's scary isn't it? Um, for some people it might have been all right because they might have saved. For other people who've just like got a new house or a mortgage or you know had a baby that was scary for them obviously. It was a bit sketchy but at the same time I sort of took the view of listen everyone from government to doing what we do to you know, delivery drivers, taxi drivers, to whatever job you do in the world, we were all in the same position. No one knew what the plan was, and we were just riding it. But there was a bit of support there, and it did see people through. And what's happening now is like, listen, your business can't open, you know, you can't perform, you can't earn what you'd normally earn in your taxi business, or, you know, even like, you know, um, people who do hair and beauty and travel rounds and do home appointments and barbers and everyone like that. It's like, listen, you're not allowed to work anymore and we're not gonna support you, but you can just sit at home now. Well, okay. I mean, for me, I, you know, I don't have any kids, so it's different. I've only got my own mouth and my dog to feed. <laughs> That's it. Um, but I'd say half of the guys that play on the street, I've, I've got kids and like, it's heartbreaking. We've got children to feed, I've got babies at home. 
we had three months of of literally nothing anything that anything that uh, we had like saved or anything it was literally like just like using that money and eventually that was running out and obviously i've got two kids and you know got to, got, got to put food on the table and when it got to that point it was a uh, we were like we really need this money right now so it was a bit of a it was crazy that musicians were kind of left last to receive any sort of help or actually be told that we were getting any help because at the start they basically said everyone was getting 80 percent, but didn't mention self-employed it was only because you know people were like the, the media was talking about it that they actually did something about it i'm sick of sitting in my kitchen and worrying and look watching the news every day and wondering whether i'm gonna have a, a job the next day every week i'm sick of it and then you, you you ask questions, nothing gets answered. The amount of tweets and letters and things sent to Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson, and there's literally nothing back at all. Like we don't exist. Literally, like shouting down a well, and there's nobody there. Rishi Sunak needs to be careful what he says. I left school at 15 without any GCSEs to come here, and I've trained from that day. On this street, I played in Lennon's Bar when I was a kid, and I've been playing here and I'm 38 now. I've done my training. I've way done my training. I'm way past any training anybody will ever do for any job. And it's as important as any other job. I've paid my taxes for that long. And I was doing this before he was Chancellor, and I'll be doing this long after he's gone. Yeah. And I mean, there's no way they're gonna be in power for as long as I'm gonna be a musician. I'll win to tell me to retrain if you're telling me there's never going to be a musician ever again so if it's like a coal miner situation where they're shutting coal mines because we're not going to have coal mines in this country then you've got to support me to go and retrain but that's not what they're saying they're saying right now the pubs are shut there's no gatherings there's no gigs there's no festivals there's nothing but you know we're going to get it right soon we're going to have a future where that's going to be there but retrain anyway and do it off your own mind. Yeah, no, exactly, yes. Yeah. So, you know, you're not doing anything anyway. You may as well just go and retrain. But I'm still not getting paid either way, you know. I, I think it's insulting. I think it's... I, I think it's characteristic of an abhorrent sort of system. Musicians and people in the arts, we're not, we're not deemed as viable. And it doesn't appear to, to me that they're listening. We don't know how long we're going to be out of work for. You know, the government have said that, like, we could be out of... You know, the bars could be closed for potentially six months. You know, six months of not having any sort of like financial support is, you know, it's terrifying and it's it's also unreasonable. Do you know what I mean? And for to be told that you know, like something that we've trained hard to do for so many years. You know, like most of the musicians that I work with, you know, we went to college, we went to university, we studied it. You know, it's a big part of who we are and you know our lives. And to be told that you know we've got to go and retrain and do another job, I think that's just outrageous. You know. I'm not going to mention any names at all, um, but some of the phone calls I've had and some of the times I've went to see people and sit down and try and talk to them, and I'm doing that just because I, I think that's kind of my responsibility in the job role that I do. Some, someone's got to be there for them, you know, and, and I'm trying my best to do that the best I can. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a mental health doctor, I'm, I don't know anything about anything to help people like that. There was a couple who were worried because they didn't have food in. They didn't, like, I don't know a world where I thought it was possible for us not to have food in. It is infinitely more difficult to be a self-employed person than it is to be an employed person doing pay-as-you-earn tax. We have to do our tax every year. You know, people don't think we do our tax every year. We think we're just getting cash in hand and we don't pay towards anything. Whereas anybody who pays rent, has had a mortgage, gets financed on a car, anything, will tell you, you need three years of good books at least before you can do anything. And they're just discounting that because, I don't know, I don't know why they don't like self-employed people. Maybe it's too difficult for them to recoup the tax from us. Maybe they need to look at what they're doing rather than what we're doing. But it, it, yeah, I, I, I think just writing off a whole sector of people is it's just criminal. I mean, it's the same as always, isn't it? The communication is, if you're in the pockets of the Tory party, you'll have the communication lines. But if you're not, you don't get it. They're not interested in letting us know what's happening. They don't care about our future. Why will they tell us what's going to happen in the future? It's, the, the future doesn't have us in it. And well, why, why, would we, why would we be worth it to those Tory party members? Why, why would we be worth it? 
we don't want extra we just want the same as everybody else we're human as well as everybody else and it's it's, it's frustrating and it's it's quite sad i don't just feel angry i feel sad i feel like heartache over it it hurts you know david dutton put a uh an update on the page asking musicians to write a song. So, uh, quite a few people have written songs. We've got Ollie Nish has written a song, uh, Ethan Allen's written a song, and then I, I wrote a song. Um, I think, you know, for, for musicians, it's very cathartic, you know, anything that's on your mind, you know, you feel like you've um, got something off your chest. But it also raises awareness of, of the issues that musicians are finding themselves in at the moment, and especially the, the music video. You know, the music video is, uh, features um, footage of all of the bands and singers that play on Matty Street. Paradoxically, it feels like this year has both flown by and at the same time like it's dragged on forever. With this government, it seems to be a regular pattern that the facts that we learnt a week ago suddenly don't ring true anymore. When I started filming, the Liverpool City region was the only area in a Tier 3 lockdown. At the time of recording this voiceover, several more northern counties are now under the new restrictions including Greater Manchester, Warrington, Lancashire, South Yorkshire and Nottingham. Contrarily, most regions in the South are at Tier 1 or Tier 2, where despite some restrictions, such as no mixing of different households, the pubs remain open and the music plays on. When I began filming, the level of support being offered to self-employed people was at just 20% of their taxable profits. Rishi Sunak announced an increase to 40% on the 22nd of October. Despite this, it still means the self-employed are taking a hit of 27% compared to people on the government's job support scheme. The third grant will cover the months of November and December 2020 and January 2021, which means that no support was available to the self-employed between the months of September and October this year. Most of us are likely to use this third grant to pay off outstanding bills that we've accrued during these two missing months, and we'll be back to square one again, waiting patiently for either restrictions to end or holding out for the fourth grant, which will cover February, March and April 2021. With no end in sight, no timetable in place, it looks set to be a miserable and bleak winter for the self-employed. Some of us will be forced to retrain, to rethink our lives because of desperation and uncertainty. We'll be forced to apply for jobs we have no experience with in order to make ends meet, just to have some financial security until we can get back to utilising our talents, our years of training and experience, and doing the job that we love. No doubt, in a week's time, the rules and regulations will change yet again, and this documentary will be a dated time capsule of the struggles that we faced. But myself, and many other like-minded people, 
won't forget so easily the way our governments treated us when times were hard. Certain businesses weren't affected. Some people have obviously done better, I think, haven't they, since the pandemic and things, but ours wasn't one of those, unfortunately. And I'm sure most people in this industry will agree it was hard. And even when, after the, the first lockdown, when we reopened, um, it took us quite some time to get used to the new new way of life after the coronavirus. Well, our local council, was, you know, the discussions there were led by uh, Joe Anderson and Steve Rotherham. Uh, and in Manchester, they were led by Sasha, who's a mate of mine, and, uh, and Andy Vernon. Uh, they're two heavyweights, they're two real they're heavy hitters, and I think Manchester got a better deal. It's an absolute scandal, I mean, the way it's been handled, the way it's been rolled out, the way that they press, they've been leaking to press uh, to soften the blow before it comes out, it's sort of a shock if you drop it on people. It just makes people feel a little bit um, under, undersold what, uh, what's going on. I don't know, it was just, it feels like a personal attack on like this part of the country. Last week when I was watching the, before Boris's speech, he, um, there were these guys in Downing Street with all the charts and everything, and he took questions off the news and he was saying, you know, it's also quite bad in Oldham and Blackburn and different places. But as soon as he went back to the expert, he, he just kept mentioning Merseyside. He knows that he's not really going to get, going to get any votes this part of the country at all. I hate doing this whole north-south divide thing, but it, there's a, it's a north-south divide. It's as simple as that. We're seeing all these, every, every when we see the, the graphs and say, look, here's how bad it is in the Northwest and here's how this is and here's how... In the first lockdown, we went into national lockdown because the highest area with the infection was London, was around that area. And when it was bad there, the whole country went into lockdown. Now they've gone, oh, well, look, this Merseyside, that looks high. We'll just close them. Let's just close them. I just, I, I don't... Maybe it's that whole thing of growing up around that time where, you know, London hated Merseyside. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. I've got these tinted glasses where I think we're uh, we're not taking us serious. And uh, yeah, I do. I, th I think we were the experiment. With my empty diary, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna fill it with things fighting against this Tory party and making us be heard because. This just isn't on. From here on, there's just going to be bigger and better campaigns, and it's all going to be safe. But we are going to be heard, like I'm telling you. I'm telling you now, we're going to push for this. I still can't believe that people voted him in because, you know, you know, it's not as if he's had a glowing CV, you know what I mean? Every job that he's done, he's fucked it up, do you know what I mean? And like, I just think anyone with an ounce of sensibility would know not to vote for him. But they did and we're in the situation so obviously there's nothing we can do but you know, 100% is, this is the government's fault and it, it's very upsetting and angry that like, you know, they're trying to put the blame onto the population. I started off this whole process and I, I kind of felt for him because he, was, he wasn't voted in for a pandemic, he was voted in by people who, who wanted Brexit. It's a completely separate issue. His whole cabinet was built around Brexit. They weren't prepared for this like every other country in the world weren't prepared for this. You know, I see gripes about the rules and everything else, but you look at what's happened in Europe as well. They're shutting pubs, they're shutting venues, they've got curfews. You know, everyone's going through similar things, just at different times and different speeds and efficiency. And I need Boris Johnson to sort his act out. Be clear. If it's bad news, just say it. Bad news is bad news. You sometimes, being a leader means you've got to deliver bad news when you have to deliver it. You just need clarity. We All, all we want is to know what's going on and why, and how it affects us, and what we can be doing. Boris Johnson certainly has a vendetta against Merseyside, 100%. And he's not the only one as well. I think, inherently, the Tory party have a vendetta against anyone who speaks out against them, or doesn't vote for them. And because we haven't voted for them 
for so long. They hate us, and they want they want to do us wrong. And they know we need help here, but they don't care. They, as long as they're supporting that London bubble, they do not care about us here at all. We we have to we have got to fight against this. We as musicians, as anyone who's self-employed, anyone who believes in justice should be fighting against this and should not stand by and let this crap happen.